You know what's weird is when I do these live, it's so much easier. I really wind up looking at stuff, and it's like, I didn't have to edit that. That was neat. But when I record stuff, I get inside my own head, and now I'm going to have to edit all this stuff out. It drives me insane. Today, I'm going to be reviewing the JBL 4329P. This is a bookshelf-style speaker, but as you can see, it's pretty large. It actually came from a viewer and a friend of mine, John Sherman, of the Screening Room AV. He owns a couple stores, one out in Colorado and another one in Nevada. And I have some of the information if you'd like to contact him. Now, the reason I'm throwing this up here for you all is because support the people who support the channel. Support the science and support the review method that I choose to incorporate. Rather than just being a shill and saying something's great when it's not, people like John send me whatever and they don't care what I say as long as I just be honest. So in return, I prep them and I say, hey, go buy some stuff from them. So if you wanna do that, if you're out in his area, please check his store out, give him a call and talk to him about your own home theater needs today. It is also worth noting that even though I just plugged him, I didn't get paid for any of this stuff. So the only money that I'll make from this video is YouTube ad revenue, which will probably be about 30 bucks if I'm lucky. The 4329P comes in two different styles, one in black and then the other one in a walnut color. And you can see on the back of the speaker, there are a few different inputs and I'll name a couple of them, USB, optical, it's also Bluetooth, analog in and 3.5 millimeter jack input. The speaker on the front features an eight inch midwoofer, a set of ports, and then a one inch compression driver in a JBL high definition imaging horn design. The speaker does come with a remote and then it comes with an ethernet cable to link the speakers together. However, there is no HDMI input. The built-in DAC supports 24 192 sampling and then it also has Apple Play 2. So if you wanna do streaming directly to the speakers, you can do that from your phone. And I did that a lot. I also listen via analog input from my DAC. So I did a couple different methods of listening. And for what it's worth, I also listen to these speakers in two different rooms that are completely different just to try to see how good they sound or maybe how bad they sound in each room. And moving on with the pros, I'll piggyback right off of that and say they sounded great in both rooms. So this speaker truly has pretty much full range. It's 30 hertz to 20 kilohertz anechoic. And when you put it in a room, it gets down into the 20 hertz region, obviously depending on your room size and positioning, but it has no problem playing very, very low. There is great linearity with the speaker with some caveats that I'll note when we get into the data. There's also excellent directivity, but again, with some caveats that I'll get into with the data. The retail price on these speakers is about $4,500 per pair. Now moving on to the cons, there's a couple of them. Personally speaking, I wish the speaker had HDMI input. Another thing is the link cable for the speakers. So what happens is you hook up the main speaker, which you can choose to be your left or right. It has two of the analog inputs and that's how I ran it. And then out of that speaker comes an ethernet cable to connect it to the other speaker. The problem that I have is the supply cable just really isn't that long. I don't know the exact length of it, but it was barely long enough for me to use in my listening and it actually didn't sit on the floor. It had to sit above the floor, just kind of dangling between the two speakers. So I will say that if you have your speakers positioned more than like maybe six feet apart, order you a different cable, maybe contact JBL and ask them what they recommend, but maybe something like Amazon you could be fine with. I don't know 100% sure, but if JBL is listening, I really would wish you guys would put maybe like a 10 or a 15 foot cable in there just for people like me who had the need to put speakers further apart. But in terms of sound, I didn't have really any issues, truthfully. I listened to these speakers for like an hour, just jamming out, and I never had listener fatigue, and I never got bored with them. The bass is awesome. There's a cover by Aloe Black of the Staples' I'll Take You There song, and that song starts off with a strong mid-bass thunk. Man, these speakers deliver every bit of that, and it is freaking awesome. I'm a little bit of a bass head, I'm not gonna lie. It doesn't mean like I listen to really ridiculously loud levels of bass, but when a speaker can play down to 50 or 40 hertz without any problem, I love it because so much of the music that I listen to has strong kick drums. So I need a good solid 50 hertz fundamental. I don't need a speaker that's rolling off for 60 or 70 hertz and barely touching 50 by the time it gets there. 
I need something that gets at least to 50 hertz with strong authority. These speakers get down to 30 hertz anechoic and 20 hertz in the room without an issue. As far as positioning and things like that goes, I try these speakers directly on axis and then point it out 30 degrees and everywhere in between. And generally what I found was that I liked anywhere from zero to 20 degrees. Now the good thing about this particular design is that it has very wide horizontal dispersion compared to most other horn designs. And I say that because these speakers are at about plus or minus 60 degrees to the mid range. A lot of other horn type designs are at about plus or minus 40 degrees to the mid range. And it's just not wide enough for me to get the ambiance in the room and the reflections that I really want in order to give me a personal subjectively great feeling about the speaker. Usually what happens is you have to tow the speaker so far out that you lose high frequency. So the high frequency rolls off in order to achieve wide stereo imaging. You don't have that with these speakers. They have a good constant directivity through the mid range up to the treble that keeps the speakers really wide, even without having to tow them out. Or if you want to tow them out, there's a little bit of a roll off in the high frequency, but it's not bad. So in other words, you have a lot of wiggle room to really finagle these speakers to sound the way that you really want them to sound or the best way that they can sound in your room. So I'm gonna move on to the data and we're gonna talk about what's in the data, how that relates to my listening impressions and see if I can marry the two up, help you understand some of the things that matter, some of the things that may not matter quite as much. I do all of my testing with the Klippel Near Field Scanner. This is a state of the art measurement device. And with this data, we can get a good idea of how well the speaker is performing on its own before it even enters the room. And that's important to understand because if you have a bad speaker and you put it in a great room, it's still a bad speaker. You don't know that without anechoic data though. First thing we're gonna look at is the on-axis linearity and the listening window. So you can see from this graphic, the on-axis linearity looks pretty good for the most part, but there are certainly some standout areas and one particular being this dip right here at around 900 Hertz or so. On the positive side, however, look at the bass. F3 at 31 Hertz. This sucker gets low. So I've called out the response getting down to 30 Hertz, but I've also called out this dip. I'm not sure exactly what's causing this dip, but I can tell you 100% without a doubt, it's not the ports because I also, also measured this speaker with the port stuff just to make sure there was no out of phase anomaly coming from the port chambers. There isn't. So my best guess is that this dip is caused by the lip of the speaker control panel. And I'll show you that real fast. Okay. So you can see that this speaker, the midwoofer, would hit this bottom side, and then that would create some kind of cancellation effect. And according to my math, that would occur at about 1500 hertz for a half wave, and then for a quarter wave, it would be around, what is it, about 750 hertz or so. That's my best guess, is that it's some kind of diffraction effect, either from the top of that control panel or maybe from the side where the grill snaps into place, because the grill is removable. Now, removing the grill didn't fix any of this either. This is the Spinorama data, which gives us an idea of how equalizable the speaker is, how uniform is the speaker on and off axis as you move around the speaker and as you go above and below the speaker. And we can see the same thing that we saw earlier in the black and the green dashed line, which are again, the on axis and the listening window response. So a spatial average plus or minus 30 degrees to the side, plus or minus 10 degrees above and below the overall on axis performance. But the thing that's really noteworthy is just how good the sound power tracks and the early reflections track to the on axis and the listening window. So that means that the speaker is going to be equalizable should you want to make things adjusted to your own taste. And the main thing though, is that the sound that's sent out into the room is very similar in timbre to the sound that you listen to directly on axis or however the first direct line of sound comes to you. If you have the speaker turned a little bit off axis or something like that, that direct sound is still gonna sound very similar to the sound that's reflected out into the room and back to your ears. So that means that you're not gonna have a big discrepancy in the overall timbre of the speaker, no matter how you aim it, or really no matter what rooms you put it in. So I can put it in my living room and I can put it in my bedroom and the overall sound is very similar. I also wanted to call attention to the two areas that you cannot equalize, and that's the same areas that I just talked about above. So you're not gonna be equalized those because the directivity mismatch is mainly in the vertical response. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is the estimated in-room response at zero degrees and at 30 degrees, and you can see they track pretty well. There's not a lot of bunching up indicating that there's not any kind of directivity mismatch through the horizontal response at least. 
And if you wanted to tailor the sound overall, you could just turn it off axis or more on axis, depending on what it is that you're looking for in your room. And here's a general trend line where I pointed out, what does it mean when you have that dip at around 900 and that dip at around 1.6? So I was able to equalize those up a little bit. It didn't make a huge difference, but it did make a little bit of a difference, at least to my biased sided testing. And what I noticed was that by boosting that 900 Hertz up a little bit, it gave the snare a little bit more of a thwack sound, right? Just a little bit more character to some snares. When I boosted that 1.6 kilohertz area up a little bit, there was a little bit more attack, especially like in, in saxophone and trumpet. I noticed that this is the horizontal radiation. And you can see that it's about plus or minus 60 degrees to the mid range actually starts off around 70. And as you go through the upper mid range and into the treble, it trends downward to about 50 degrees at 20 kilohertz. So this speaker has a more narrowing radiation pattern into the higher frequency, which is good. I say that because if this speaker were showing a perfectly symmetrical directivity or horizontal radiation, more than likely then it would sound too bright in the room. So the fact that it's kind of closing in as you go a little bit further off axis, that means that the off axis energy is gonna be reduced enough to where the sum in your seated position isn't gonna sound flat. And that's what you want. You want the estimated in-room response or the actual in-room response to be sloped down a little bit. I have a whole video about flat anechoic versus flat in-room and why you don't want flat in-room. Make sure to check that video out when you get some time if you haven't seen it already. This is another way of looking at the same data. So this is the zero degree response and all of the other axes. All the other axes are compared to zero degrees, which means that it's normalized. And really what you wanna see is you wanna see the line through here be pretty much flat. That would indicate then that all the off axis energy is very much similar to the on axis energy and that's what I talked about earlier, where you want those sounds to be similar. This is the vertical radiation. And then what I'm seeing in this data is don't go beyond about plus or minus 10 degrees of that tweeter line, because if you do, you're gonna suffer a lot in the overall character of the speaker. Harmonic distortion, 86 dB at one meter, super, super low. 96 dB at one meter, again, super, super low. And multi-tone distortion, full range. There is some peaking going on around this 800 to one kilohertz region. And I find that interesting because that's also around where that dip occurs when we looked at the frequency response. Are those related? Possibly. I thought maybe it was the port. So that's why I measured the speaker with the port stuff and it didn't change anything. So it's not the port. I'm not sure exactly what's causing that. The main question though is, is it audible? Normally, if this were broad through here, going through the entire mid range, I would say, yeah, you're probably gonna run into some trouble. I have had issues where I'm pretty sure that I've noticed it in other speakers, but in this particular speaker, there wasn't anything that really stood out to me as being noticeable. However, you had the data, so if you don't wanna take my word for it, you've got the data. Now we're gonna look at the compression, or in this case, the limiting effect. So most pro audio speakers, powered studio speakers, are gonna have a limiter built into them, mainly to keep the levels from getting too out of line to where you would damage the speaker. And what I'm seeing here in this speaker is pretty indicative of that, especially when you're talking about the low frequency area where there's more compression. Uh, the one thing that I find interesting is there's stronger compression around where we saw the on axis and slightly off axis dips. And then there is some enhancement again around that 1.6 kilohertz area. Now I'm thinking this is probably the tweeter. Maybe there's some distortion coming into play there. I mean, I'm not 100% sure. When I go back and look at the actual distortion data, we can see that there is a relative rise there, but if I'm being honest, I don't really know what's causing this particular increase and dip, but nevertheless, it shows up in the data. I trust the data. Are you gonna hear it as an issue? I don't know. This points to it not being a quote unquote perfect speaker. So these are kind of the areas where there's a limitation of the speaker. It shows up in the frequency response and it shows up in the limiting compression data as well. But my final impression is that despite the nonlinearities in a couple key places, I really enjoyed the speaker. Sonically, I don't have any gripes about it at all. And those notches that we see in the response, at least they're notches, at least they're not boost because boosts are gonna be more offensive more noticeable, as opposed to a notch, you may just think maybe something's not there or you wouldn't quite notice it unless you were able to equalize it up and quickly A, B the two differences. So I'm not really giving the speaker a pass in terms of its flaws in that regard, but I am saying that in the grand scheme of things, 
with everything else the speaker has going on for it, the deep bass extension, the generally overall great linearity, and the very smooth directivity horizontally, the wide radiation, those are all great pluses for me. And that's why I would still recommend the speaker despite some of those anomalies that we did see. And that really does it for this review. If you appreciate it, if you learned something, please give this video a thumbs up, smash the fire to that thumbs up button because that helps me a lot. If you're not a subscriber and you'd like to subscribe, please remember to hit the subscribe button below. I said button below. I'm not editing that one out. Um, if you'd like to support otherwise, I have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. If you want to go check that out, that would be appreciated. Or if you just want to use any of my generic affiliate links in the description below, you can do that by just checking out the description below, follow any of those links, type in whatever it is you want to buy, buy through that link, and that will help earn me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And that allows me to keep this channel going. I once again want to thank John for loaning me this pair of speakers. And unfortunately, I am going to have to send them back because I would love to rock them. JBL, if you guys are listening, if there's any way that you can add HDMI input to this speaker, that would be awesome. That does it for this review. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.